this morning, we're almost done. Two more chapters in the, our book, our journey through Joshua. Two more chapters left, and today we're going to be in Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23, and I've titled today's message, Joshua's First Farewell Speech. Joshua's first farewell speech. And as you turn there to Joshua 23, let me just begin by sharing a few things. Now, in our previous chapter, when we covered it last week, week chapter 22, it, there, that chapter records the last major crisis in the conquest narrative. And that was a big misunderstanding that took place between the Western tribes and the rest of the nine and a half tribes. And it was all clarified. It was all a big misunderstanding. And we went through that. But that was the last major crisis in this, in this entire book. As I mentioned last week, the book of Joshua now begins to close here with an old soldier, an old warrior, saying goodbye, saying his farewells. And as you read them, as we go through them, you can, you'll be able to tell that his parting, these last words, these addresses, these speeches, they're tinged with sadness as anybody's last words. They expressed the deep concern of Joshua, who observed a growing complacency on the part of Israel towards the remnants of the Canaanites. See, now that the enemies had been vanquished, Joshua knew how dangerous it could be when people put their guard down. So before his departure from active leadership, he felt compelled to warn the nation, to warn the people that he loved, that continued obedience to God's commands it was essential. It was essential to continued enjoyment of his full blessings. Now we're going to be covering a lot of things here in this chapter in particular, but as I said this morning, we're going to be looking at the first of two farewell addresses by Joshua, where primarily here he'll be speaking to the leadership of Israel. And there's going to be a lot here. There's going to be reminders, instructions, some warnings, encouragement, and you're going to hear his heart as well. See, church, the overall idea here, the overall main idea that I hope that you will understand as we go through this chapter is in good times and in bad times, in times of harvest and in times of famine, it's important, it's necessary for us, for you, to study God's word and remember that everything that he promised has come to pass and will come to pass. See, because of that, because of his, God's past reliability in keeping his promises, Right now, all of you can have present, present confidence in the words that you are reading in his word. I'll get more into that as we get to the study, as we get into our, our reading and our message here. But again, he's reliable. He keeps his promises. So before we, get, we read, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we're here today because of you. We're here today because 
we have a reason and purpose behind all that is happening and all that is going on. And so now as we sit here, we ask you that you make that purpose known. Make it, and make it known clearly. Lord, we need your wisdom. We want your wisdom and we want to draw nearer to you as we get into these words of yours. So heal hearts, change minds, give new perspectives on life and this world. Pray for those watching and listening that you will also work powerfully. And that all those that are listening or watching this will know and understand how magnificent, wonderful, and merciful you are. So keep us safe now as we sit together here at and hear your word and protect us from all harm, Lord, and that we just enjoy this time with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Joshua 23, verse 1. And the word of God says, A long time after the Lord had given Israel rest from all the enemies around them, Joshua was old, advanced in age. So Joshua summoned all Israel, including its elders, leaders, judges, and officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age, and you have seen for yourself everything the Lord your God did to all these nations on your account, because it was the Lord your God who was fighting for you. See, I have allotted these remaining nations to you as an inheritance for your tribes, including all the nations I have destroyed from the Jordan westward to the Mediterranean Sea. The Lord your God will force them back on your account and drive them out before you so that you can take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong and continue obeying, what, obeying all that is written in the book of the Law of Moses so that you do not turn from it to the right or left and so that you do not associate with these nations remaining among you. Do not call in the names of their gods or make an oath to them. Do not serve them or bow in worship to them. Instead, be loyal to the, God, to the Lord your God as you have been to this day. The Lord has driven out great and powerful nations before you, and no one is able to stand against you to this day. One of, your, one of you routed a thousand because of the Lord your God was fighting for you as he promised. So diligently, diligently watch yourselves. Love the Lord your God. If you ever turn away and become loyal to the rest of these nations remaining among you, and if you intermarry or associate with them and they with you, Know for certain that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out before you. It will become a snare and a trap for you, a sharp stick for your sides and thorns in your eyes. Until you disappear from this good land the Lord your God has given you. I am now going away, going the way of the whole earth. And you know with all your heart and all your soul, that none of the good promises of the Lord your God made to you has failed. Everything was fulfilled for you. Not one promise has failed. Since every good thing the Lord your God promised you has come about, so he will bring on you. Since every good thing the Lord your God promised you has come about, so he will bring on you every bad thing until he has annihilated you from this good land the Lord your God has given you. If you break the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods, and bow and worship to them, 
the Lord's anger will, bor- will burn against you, and you will quickly disappear from this good land he has given you. Some 20, 10 or 20 years after the end of the conquest and the distribution of the land, Joshua summoned the representatives of Israel's tribes and the leaders of all the leaders of the nation. Now, some have said that he either died, did this in Shiloh or in his hometown of Ephraim. But he did that. He summoned them all to essentially give them his final State of the Union address. Now, his purpose in, in doing this stated in verse, all the way down in verse 14. I am now going the way of the whole earth. What does that mean? What was he talking about there? This is what it was basically saying. Like every human being that has ever lived in this world, I'm going to die. I'm going to die soon. Now, what's interesting is that even at the end of a long and full life, Joshua's greatest concern, it wasn't himself. It was the people. It was his people and their relationship to the Lord. He didn't want to leave them until he challenged them once again to love the Lord and keep his commandments. You see, his life, work, everything that he did up to this point would have been in vain if they failed to keep the covenant and enjoy the blessings of the promised land. So all the people, the leaders, the leadership, leaders of the tribes and the judges and all of them, they came without hesitation. They loved Joshua. They had been with him or he had been with them since they could remember. He was there in the wilderness. He was there in Egypt in the wilderness, in the crossing. So, I mean, he lived a long life. So they respected him, they loved him. And even though they may have disagreed, maybe on some of the things that he did or how he did things, like all people do with leaders, there was still that love and respect for him. So again, they came without hesitation to hear the last words of their great chief, this great warrior, this great man of God. And so the old veteran spoke basically on one theme, God's unfailing faithfulness to Israel and their corresponding responsibility to be faithful to him. And so at this gathering... Joshua reiterated Israel's history, and he connected it to their destiny. You see, from the day that Israel left Egypt, the Lord had fought for his people, and he had delivered them from his enemies, from their enemies. The Lord defeated all of Israel's enemies as a nation also marched toward Canaan, and he gave his people victory over the nations of the promised land. And he could recount this. He could tell this story because he was there. He wasn't reading a scroll. He wasn't reading a history book. He wasn't reading the accounts of somebody else. He was a firsthand witness to everything that had occurred. He was a firsthand witness As for the Canaanites who still lingered around, 
He says the Lord God would force them out also so that Israel could take possession of the land they partially occupied. Now this review of history that Joshua was doing, was stating, it, it reminded Israel of two, two great facts. First of all, those Gentile nations were God's enemies and therefore must be Israel's enemies. And two, the same God who overcame the enemy in the past could and would help Israel overcome them in the future. Notice again, I said could and would. The point again is God had never failed his people. God had never failed his people and if they would trust him and obey him, obey his word, he would completely conquer the land. They would completely conquer the land by him, Lord God, fighting for them. As you read your Bibles and see what God did in the past for those who trusted him. It should. It ought to encourage you to trust him today, right now, as you face all your enemies with courage and with confidence. No matter what those enemies are, I would encourage you Yeah, it may look different than what we read about here, what we just read about here. It may look different than the story that we read. Here's the thing. God may change his methods in your life and circumstances. He may change the way he does things to give you that victory. But... The reality is, the fact is, that his character never changes. His character never changes, my friends. So what does that mean? It means that he can be absolutely 100% trusted. He can be trusted. And secondly... In the same way he gave Israel a land to possess, God gives every believer an inheritance. If you're a born-again Christian, if you've given your heart, your life, you surrendered yourself to Jesus Christ, and he's your Lord and Savior, you've, given, you've been given an inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says we've been blessed, uh, uh, that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And God, church, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God has a definite part for us to play in coming to possess that inheritance. It's up to you whether you want to grab onto it, take hold of it. It's there. Some of you, you've been, it's been given to you, but you've got to continue to fight. You've got to, there will be times you're going to go to war, and he wants to see your faithfulness. He's saying, I'm, I've given you these promises. I've given you such an amazing inheritance and what are you going to do? Are you just going to, okay, I'm good, and just lay back and not do anything? Or are you going to keep going? Are you going to keep fighting when the enemy comes against you? Possess that promise, that inheritance. You will fully receive it when you enter into his kingdom, my brothers and sisters. 
Well, then in verses 6 through 8, Joshua turns to impress the Israelites with their responsibility. He passes on the very same words that Yahweh, that God had armed him with when he instructed him to cross the Jordan. I believe it was there in chapter 1. So he tells them here, be strong, be careful to obey. But specifically, Joshua dreaded Israel's conformity to the heathen nations that were around them. So he called them in this speech, in this farewell address, he called on them to be a separated people and not be infected, not be infected by the wickedness of the Gentile nations around them. All of us, you and I, some more than others, we feel the pressure of the world around us. You know what I'm talking about. Trying to conform us to the world standards, to the way the world sees things. To conform to these ideologies that are anti-Christian, that are anti-God, that are fully satanic. Friends, it takes courage to go against the crowd, to defy what the world is trying to shove down your throat. It's interesting that you always hear that term or that statement that, you know, Christians are trying to shove Christianity down our, our throats or something similar to that. But in all reality, the truth is it's the world that's trying to cram their beliefs, their views down the Christian's throat, down the church's throat. For what reason? Christians are those who believe in the Word of God. Those who truly know Jesus. They know that they're, those Christians are they're going, it's, it, going against them. Those people, the world, they don't want to fight either. They would just want you to go along with the program. But again, not you. Not us. Again, it takes courage to defy the crowd and stay true to the Lord. But it also takes love. It also takes love for the Lord. A true, deep Love for the Lord and a desire to please Him. To not conform to the standards of the world. Now look at verse 8. There's a word there I want you to, to notice. That word there. says, instead, be Loyal. Loyal. Notice that word. I want you to pay attention. I want to stop there for a minute. The word translated loyal in verse 8 is used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 to describe a husband's relationship to his wife. See, Israel was married to Jehovah, to the Lord at Mount Sinai, and was expected to be a faithful spouse and loyal to the Lord. Sadly and tragically, she would eventually become an unfaithful wife, a prostitute, and 
she would turn to the gods of other nations. In verses 9 through 13, Joshua then returns to his theme of God's past, past faithfulness to Israel. He tells them that God's continued fighting for them, it all depends on their continued obedience to him. Specifically, if Israel intermarries with the idolatrous nations who remain in the land, the Lord will no longer expel those people, but will allow them to bring incredible pain and discomfort to Israel. He then warns them that the disobedience would be a gradual thing. First, they would associate with these nations in a very familiar way. Just hang out. Then they would start discussing their religious practices. Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, yeah, so am I. But let me, let me tell you, you know, my church, my Christianity, Jesus allows everybody, no matter what gender you are, to, to get married with each other. I'm going to start, again, talking about religion and the practices, the differences of practices and noting similarities and maybe trying to adjust to the differences or make you adjust or Christians adjust to the differences. And before long, Israel would be worshiping the false gods of the enemy. Likewise, Christians, it won't take long when they start compromising in their faith, when they allow other things, other people, other gods, other religious practices to come and creep into the church. You've got to be careful about that. You've got to be careful about that. What you're listening to, who you're listening to, That's why it's so important that you know what God is saying, what the Word of God says, and compare it to that person that you're listening and watching. That includes me. Pay attention. It's very easy for just... The, the devil to creep in, the enemy, the world to creep in and start messing everything up, confusing you even more, especially if you're a new believer. I've seen many new Christians, new believers go from church to church to church to church because they've gotten so confused. All these scandalous and false teachers and preachers. Pay attention to their teachings. And as I said, that applies to me as well. Sin will bring incredible pain and discomfort to you too. You read that, how it's described again. And think of sin as I read this. If you ever turn away and become loyal to the rest of these nations remaining among you and you intermarry or associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations. They will become a snare and a trap for you. Again, sin here. They will become a snare and trap for you, a sharp stick for your sides and thorns in your eyes until you disappear from this good land the Lord your God has given you. Again, 
again, describing here, and first of all, in our passage, that Jewish men would start marrying women from these false pagan nation, and then the line of separation between God's people and the world would be completely erased. So it's clear that Joshua didn't contemplate any possibility of neutrality as he posed the choice to be made. The nation Israel would either go with Israel's God or the people of Canaan, the gods of those people. There is no in-between. It's either or. You and I, we need to hear the same admonition as the Israelites. We live as light in darkness. You are a light on a hill. You are, you are the salt of the nation. You are the salt in your communities, in your schools, in your work in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your communities. You are that light in darkness. I remember hearing a story of someone saying, oh, well, I don't go here or associate with those people or, you know, um, and, I, and I once replied, that even in those places, a light is needed. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, bars and strip clubs or, you know, anything like that. I'm, I'm just talking about, you know, workplace, other types of workplaces. Oh, I, I can't work there because, you know, it's full of non-Christians. I can't go to that school because non-Christian schools. I can't, you know, I, everything I have to be around, it has to be all Christians, all believers. That's good for encouragement, and that's good for, you know, if you have to be around like-minded people. But we mustn't completely separate ourselves from those on the outside. It's very easy to be put into a bubble, to place yourself in a bubble. It's okay to go to those family dinners where everyone is maybe now a different faith than you are, or maybe a different political affiliation than you. Ultimately, you're a Christian, you're a believer. The Lord has set you apart. You are now a light. That's what he's called you, and you ought to be a light in those dark places. Now, sometimes those places you go to can be intentional, and sometimes they can be accidental. But again, there's no accidents, right? With the Lord, everything happens for a reason and purpose. Don't fear. Don't fear going out there, my friends. Come on, again, the Lord... Giving you victory. Ask him for strength to empower you, just not even to, again, to, to be that annoying Christian, but just to be a loving Christian, to be a loving believer, to show those that once found you annoying and despicable. That you're now a changed person. Be that light in those areas. Be a light, my friends. Darkness must not stuff out our light or snuff out our light. But here's the thing, and this is the warning. We shouldn't fraternize. Fraternizing is something completely different than, you know, 
just keep, you know, just having a, a lunch or uh, a dinner or you know, going to a social gathering. We should not fraternize with those likely to lead us astray. Don't fraternize. Don't intermarry. Don't get involved with those that are going to lead you away. You know who those people are. Every, you know, every person has those people that they know if they, can go, if they go hang out with them, it's not going to be very long before you start looking like them, talking like them, and behaving like them. As a believer, as a Christian, you must make the decision to obey God and abandon all imposters. Abandon all imposters. There is no middle course. You've heard that verse. No one can serve two masters. Who is your master? Who is your master? It's Jesus. You can't serve another. All right. Well, like a masterful preacher, in verses 14 through 16, Joshua restated his discourse, this time emphasizing that he was a dying man, hoping, hoping that his world, that this would make his words sink more deeply into the hearts of the people. Once again, knowing Israel was at high risk of contracting amnesia, or at best, short memory, Joshua calls to their attention the fact that God not only deposits to their account, but he can also withdraw from it. He deposits into their account, but he can also withdraw from it. Friends, God, the Lord God, Yahweh, he owns the bank. God's word in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 to 11 tells us, He chastises us, His children, by faith in Christ. Why? Because He loves us. At this very moment, you're being, you feel like you're being chastised by God. Chastised, you know, the way I... I don't have the exact interpretation the way I interpret it. It's giving that, that chancla to the butt. You know? But he does that. Even to me, and maybe he's doing that to some of you because we're his children. And he loves us. He does not love to chastise us, but his love for us obliges, us obliges him to discipline us. And so he blesses us and punishes us like the good father that he is. God gives Israel the land, but he will permit them to be destroyed if the land in, that will permit them to be dis destroyed in the land if, if they disobey. And of course, that happened in 587 B.C. during the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the deportation of the people to a 70-year exile in Babylon. Abandoning the covenant of God would result in the God of the covenant abandoning them. 1,400 years after Joshua, Paul would write an appropriate word for the church. In Galatians 6-7, he says, 
Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. In the final analysis, even though Israel disobeyed and was eventually evicted from the promised land, God would not eventually, would, God would not ultimately destroy them completely because He promised salvation would come out of the tribe of Judah. Exiles from Judah, along with others, finally came out of Babylon's Babylonian at captivity and re-entered the promised land. And then what happened about 500 years later? Something that we're going to be celebrating in two weeks? Two weeks? Christmas is in two weeks? About 500 years later, a child, a baby was born in Bethlehem of Judah, who would be the savior of the world. Friends, God saved Judah in order to keep the promise that he made about 2,000 years earlier. But here's the thing also, keep in mind. We mustn't presume on the covenantal love of God. Salvation should produce works. Works cannot produce salvation. Therefore, our works of love and service for God must be an expression not of our working for salvation, but rather working from salvation. Works. The best way to describe it again is don't allow works to be the reason why you're saved. You do the works because you are saved. It comes from the heart. It comes from the change that God has made in your life. What he's done in your life. If you're sitting here or you're watching this and you're thinking, oh, I just have to do this and this and this and that. My church says I've got to do all these sacraments or I've got to give a certain amount of money or you know, go to church a certain amount of times during the week. Whatever it is, those are all works. Those things will not save you, my friends. Those things will do nothing for you. What matters what the Lord wants to see is that inward change, that salvation that comes from the heart, that comes from Jesus and Him alone. And when that change happens, when that change truly happens, those works will come not from you, from your own strength and power, from the spirit that's working in you. The love that you have for your brothers and sisters here in church. The love that you have to see them grow. The love you have from encouraging them when they're going through difficult times. you doing that today? Does that describe you? I hope so, my friends. I hope that it is, that you are, that the Holy Spirit is working in you, and those works are apparent. Let me repeat that. God must be an expression not of our working for salvation, but rather working from salvation. Our love for God must result in obedience. And we love Him 
Because what? Because why? Because he loved us. Let me tell you a good way. An excellent way of or a strong motivation for obedience. Meditating on the goodness of God. Meditating on the goodness of God is a strong motivation for obedience. James connects the goodness of God with our resisting temptation in chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. And the prophet Nathan took the same approach when he confronted King David with his sins in 2 Samuel chapter 12. It wasn't his own badness, but his father's goodness that brought the prodigal son to repentance and then back home. And it was the father's goodness. It says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. But there's a warning here too. We've got to be careful here with this as well. See, the danger is that the material blessings from the Lord can so possess our hearts that we focus on the gifts and forget the giver. And this leads to sin. So what do we see again in this chapter? This chapter, Joshua's three main admonitions in, in this address, they need to be heeded by us as God's people today. Verse 6, keep God's word. Verse 8, cling, cleave, hold on to the Lord. Verse 11, love the Lord. But there's something else. There's also a word for the church that needs to be heard today. There's a danger in neglecting God after being blessed by God. Therefore, Our lives must scream reminders of the goodness of God. This chapter, in fact, screams of God's goodness. It is full of God. Here's the thing also. Joshua didn't finish the job. But you know who would? Jesus. He would finish the job. And so just as the Holy Spirit empowered the Israelite soldiers, and he gives an example here that one of them chases a thousand, likewise, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do equally great things for God as as he reminds us, the Holy Spirit reminds us of what God has done for us. So let me begin closing by wrapping up what we covered in this chapter. Joshua's admonitions to the tribes east of the Jordan and to Israel here in this chapter indicate important points for today. Regardless of how things were back at this time when the story was written, or how things are right now, individual believers, and as the body of Christ, we should always remember, we should always recall what God has done and trust God when suffering and conflict arises because of life in this fallen world. Be a witness and remember, too, of what God has done in your life, how he rescued you from the pit, 
how the blood of Jesus saved you and how he changed your life from being that broken, ugly sinner to now a wonderful, beautiful child of God. The people of God, whether in Joshua's day or right now today, we must guard against allowing those outside the church to influence our spiritual lives and values. should go out there and be witnesses, be light in the dark, in those dark places, be a salt in those areas that have no salt, has, it's just tasteless. Yes, we got to be a light, but we shouldn't allow that darkness to penetrate in the church, in your lives. Don't let those outside to influence your spiritual life. As Christians, we must always be careful to always love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Why? Because the object of our affections becomes, becomes the source of all their blessings and benefits. The object of our affections becomes the source of all their blessings and benefits. Conversely, when believers turn cold in respect to the Lord, as it says in verse 12, they can expect spiritual progress in, the, in their lives to be severely hampered. Friends, verse 14 told us that God has kept his promises and will continue to do so. However, just as God's just as God's beneficent promises have been fulfilled, verse 15 also shows us so his punitive ones, so will his punitive, so will his punitive ones. Yes, even those, those of us that have truly trusted Christ for salvation may experience severe chastisement from God if they insist on living in ways that put themselves at a cross, at a, puts us against God's purposes, God's revealed will. That's found in Scripture. In other words, He will chastise you. He will punish you. He will, as His child, if you're living your life in a way that's against what He wants for you, what He says in His Word He wants for you. And so if that's go what's going on in your life, if you're feeling some kind of chastisement right now, Examine what's really going on in your life. Examine, are you doing something that is against His will for your life? Are you purposely disobeying what He says, what Jesus says, clearly says about sin? even certain sins. And if that's the case, my friends, my brother and sister, turn away and come back to the Lord. Ask for forgiveness. Ask Him to change your heart. Ask Him to change what's going on in your life. To remove those aspects, those idols, I should say, that are in, still in your heart. There's nothing better than to have an obedient children. Those of you that are parents, you know, it's, it's horrible. 
when they disobey, when your children disobey. But it's so great when they do obey you. The nation of Israel under Joshua could not afford to be presumptuous about their relationship with God. And you know what? Neither should we as born-again believers. I hope that sheds some light here on chapter 23. If you're watching this right now, wherever you're at, and you understand, you see your need for Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to the cross to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but maybe, you're, again, you're, you're watching this and you're still confused and you're still not sure. And Well, let me just try to tell you simply, a better Joshua, a better Joshua has come, and his name is Jesus. He is the exact representation of God. His words are the words of God. He is God incarnate. There's no one that has ever been like him. And there, no one will ever be like him. He lived this life sinless, for what reason? To become a sacrifice for you. As I mentioned a bit ago, a few weeks we're going to be celebrating Christmas and you see those images of little baby Jesus on a manger. Have you ever looked at that image and really thought about what that child would grow up to eventually become and what he would eventually do for you? Not just for the world, but for you. He would be betrayed by his friends. He would be abandoned by his friends, betrayed by one friend. He would be handed over to the Romans and beaten, tortured. Nails would be put through his hands, nailed through his feet a crown of thorns on his head. He would be mocked, be severely treated, treated not just by the people, the guards, the Romans, but the people down, but there's also two other criminals that at first, both of them were mocking him. But he did that. He suffered and endured, endured all that to forgive you of all your sins. Past, present, and future. So that you may have a relationship with God. If that's what you'd like. If you would like to have your sins forgiven and be made right with God. Again, I invite you to the cross to ask Jesus to become your Lord and Savior. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name. Amen. 
Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.